Citizens versus Markets is the title, and um, I contributed to a chapter to a book called Citizens versus Markets. That is, uh, actually, here's a book plug. I wasn't intended to do a book plug, but here's a book plug. Coming out um, uh, this month, uh, a book by Rauch Litch, and it was exploring the reactions of civil society to the financial crisis. And really, I was going to explore, has anything five years after the collapse of the Lehman Brothers you know, really changed in the economy? Uh, and if not, you know, why not? And what else could we do? Um, and you know, I've set it up as, as this uh, battle between citizens and markets, which is, which is something which you know, not everybody would necessarily accept, but I'm going to explore that as well. So uh, we start with a very reasonable question from a uh, person who you will recognize. Uh, she famously asked, the Queen famously asked, uh, when she opened a new building at the London School of Economics a year after the crash, um, so if these things were so large, how come everyone missed them? Now, the great brains at the London School of Economics uh, took a little while to think about that. <laughs> um, and, and they came up with this answer, which I'll read out for those that can't necessarily see it. Everyone seemed to be doing their job properly on its own merit. And according to standard measures of success, they were often doing it well. The failure was to see how collectively this added up to a series of interconnected imbalances over which no single authority had jurisdiction. Are you all feeling better now about that? <laughs> so uh, very pleased. That, by the way, I've got a master's degree from the London School of Economics. Uh, so, uh, but luckily, uh, you know, I now understand uh, the master's in economics as taught here, which is a proper master's in economics. So who did see it coming? Here's a little plug for Neff. Removing controls over the finance sector paved the way for its rise to dominance. Financial institutions, we contend, no longer act as servants to the real economy, but as its masters. There will be a collapse in the credit system in the rich world, led by the United States, in which case the probability of a financial crisis rises appreciably, said the New Economics Foundation in 2003. Not true that nobody saw it coming. There are, in fact, a number of economists. In fact, somebody wrote a book that identified seven or eight economists who all... Um, by having an understanding of alternative systems of economic thought, could see that there was a massive financial crash on the horizon. Steve Keen, Australian economist, famously one of them, and there were others. So this question of citizen versus markets. Now, uh, plenty of people that I know would reject that, that there is actually a battle between these two, these two groups because they would say, and this is the foundation, by the way, of our, of our economic thinking in the West anyway, the rich North, that free markets benefit citizens, right? Right? Everybody agree with that? <laughs> sort, of. sort of. Sort of is a good answer. That's a very good economist's answer, actually, sort of. <coughs> um, but I think that uh, I, what I'm trying to get at here is that we, I think we've got a very sterile debate, and, and this is, this is my, my sort of proof. We've got a very sterile debate about... Um, the nature of capitalism after the crisis, because where people attempted to, cha to challenge the status quo, to challenge capitalism, most recently Russell Brand, for those of you that have seen the interview on Newsnight, um, immediately the challenge comes back, well, what is it that, that you put in its place? And pretty quickly we get down to this, oh, my God, it's communism, we can't have communism, so therefore we've got to stick with what we've got, right? And, you know, this, this is the famous Daily Mail article that... that uh, that tore into uh, Ed Miliband, the leader of the opposition's father, uh, saying that he hated Britain because uh, he was a prominent Marxist theorist. I, I think that's a level of incredible hysteria that has got in the way of a sensible debate about economics. But we're going to have a sensible debate about economics tonight, so that's all right. Uh, but, and I'm not going to rake over the ashes of the, of the crisis, the financial crisis and the crash, but here's just a little interesting factoid that we trot out in, in, in presentations now and again that surprises people. So public spending, as in government spending, in the periphery countries that got into trouble, Portugal, Ireland, Spain, were all lower than Germany. Does that surprise any of you? I mean, you might all be very economically literate and know this, but you see, the way they've been painted, those economies, is as profligate, uh, waste, you know, incredible government waste, everybody's on these hugely generous salaries in the public sector, nobody pays any taxes... No, public spending in all those economies was lower than in Germany. And all of those economies, which are sort of you know, painted as economic sort of basket cases that were having to be bailed out by the rich economies, all had higher productivity growth than the German economy in the eight years up to the crisis. And I just sort of mention that really as, as, a, as, a, as an illustration of how the narrative around 
um, the economic crisis and aftermath is not always, I would suggest, very representative of the facts. Here's a reason why. I mean, this is probably as, uh, um, uh, as rude as I'm going to get about, um, about, about current institutions, given the <laughs> sort of, you know, corporate devil there. But anyway, um, there's no doubt that in, in what I look at, so I'm the head of the finance and business program at NEF, looking into reform of financial system and of business. And particularly the City of London, it has to be recognised that one reason why you might not have seen significant reform to the economy after 2008 is quite simply that they're very powerful vested interests that want to protect the status quo. And you know, we'll all be familiar with the way that, for example, multinational companies will play governments off against each other. And this is the problem, you know, with tax. You know, if you tax us, then we're going to relocate. Uh, if you regulate us in a way we don't like, we'll move to another country. Uh, this actually is very unfair to another business constituency, small and medium businesses, who are unfairly uh, unable to compete properly. Corporate lobbying is, is, a, is a huge problem in the US. It's, I would say, uh, not an insignificant problem here. There was actually an IMF paper in the International Monetary Fund that studied financial lobbying and lead up to the financial crisis, lobbying by financial firms, and it found two very interesting things. The first is that the uh, expenditure on lobbying was quite correlated to the, um, which regulations got passed through Congress. And the second thing they discovered is that those individual firms that spent the most on lobbying were the ones that took the most risks in the run-up, the, the most speculative, most financially risky in the run-up to the crisis. Um, you know, these are issues that I suggest we haven't even begun to address. So this is why I quite like this quote. Financial markets are still in charge. And this was James Carnville, advisor to President Clinton. He, when asked about, you know, he'd been talking about reincarnation, he said, well, if there is reincarnation, I always just thought I'd like to come back as Muhammad Ali or something. But now I want to come back as the bond market because you can intimidate everybody. So has there been any real reform to the economic system since 2008? OK, let's have a straw poll. <laughs> Does anybody think there has? Any, any takers for there has been any significance? So no takers for there's been significant. Uh, maybe that's a bit unfair peer pressure. You can, you can tell me afterwards if you think that there has been. Um, well, my own view would be roughly summed up by this. I'm afraid to say that uh, I, I think that, that the system is largely unchanged. So, so um, let's... let's uh, now it's time to have some real economic debate. Let's talk about this system. Let's get beyond the old left and right arguments. You know, the Cold War is over. You know, communism's gone. This doesn't mean that neoliberalism, the version that we have right now in the West, is the only or the best system of a market economy. Um, and I'm going to sort of run through the problems that are inherent in that system. And I'm going to suggest that the current economic system can't really even solve those problems. So, therefore, suggesting how it might have to change in order to solve those problems. And then we can have a discussion about it and see what you all think. So, why do we need a transition to new economics? Uh, well, there are various reasons. Um, and first, I'm going to just uh, point out that I occasionally run across what you could consider to be allies of, uh, of us at NEF in surprising places. So I just wonder who you think might have, might have said this. You know, resource constraints will at best increase energy and commodity prices over the next century, and at worst trigger a long-term decline in the global economy and civil unrest. George Osborne didn't say it. That would be a surprising ally. Um, transition town, nice maybe, or something like that. Or Head of OPEC? Well, interesting that you think it would be, uh, yes, the, 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 um, uh, Mr. Birol, the chief economist, has said some very interesting things. Well, this isn't surprising when you look at it. This was the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. Do you all know what actuaries do? I mean, they are the statisticians that calculate uh, the right sort of prices behind insurance products. Now, why would it be actually be unsurprising that they would have said that? Because they are in a little corner of the existing financial and economic system are one of the few people that take a 20, 30, 40, 50 year view. And when they take that long term view, that is their conclusion. 
So these are the four problems that we usually talk about at NEF with, with the economic system. Uh, it's unsustainable, it's unfair, it's unstable, and it's unhappy. Um, I'll try and cheer you up at the end, by the way. Mm -hmm. We'll have a song or something, you know, do a bit of dancing. So I'm going to run through these four problems. Unsustainable. Well, do you know what? I'm sure in this audience here, I don't really need to, to dwell on this. You, you kind of all know this. But there's a, there's a graph which just shows it in terms of the ecological footprint and shows that we're already consuming one and a half planets worth every year. Uh, and on the current trajectory, um, that, would, that would be three by the middle of the century, which clearly we don't have. So everyone in this room, I think, will buy into that. Unfair is, is, a, is a huge problem. Inequality, unemployment. Uh, here's some sort of few statistics to just illustrate it. But there is a great problem with creating enough good jobs for people. There is a developing inequality of both wealth and income. And some of these statistics show it. In the US, for example, the median wage of, of workers hasn't actually increased in the last 40 years. They've gone nowhere. They haven't shared at all in any growth uh, in the economy in America. <laughs> in the UK, uh, it's also equally graphic. So just to talk you through these lines, um, these are average incomes. So this thick blue line that's barely above the axis is, is 9 out of 10 of you. Um, so this is, this is um, the top 10%. But actually, even with, so that's gone up. But within there, you'll see actually all of the growth is the top 1%. Now, that's quite a significant figure, isn't it? Because the narrative of the Occupy movement was all about this economy that was serving the 1% rather than the 99%. Well, here's a graph that I'd like to suggest pretty well confirms that, at least in terms of the UK. Here's another way of looking at it. A very important economic variable is the share of national output between capital, profits, and labor, wages. And look what's happened to that since that's 1955 that period is running from, <coughs> up until 2005. And of course, you'll recognize that this period here is, is the 70s running into the 80s. That is the period when what we now call sort of neoliberalism as a sort of political economic um, set of prescriptions was applied around the world, uh, starting in the UK and the US. And that just was a massive shift of wealth away from wages, uh, people earning it through their labor, into profits. Now, that it, it has created some massive systemic problems, not just because you know, it, um, it is, you could just say it's, un, you know, it's unfair, it's not a fair division of, of spoils, but the problem is, is that actually the way that people, when their wages have stagnated, the way they've maintained consumption is to take on ever more personal debt. And that massive increase in personal debt leading up to the financial crisis um, created a huge amount of economic st instability because that debt couldn't carry on rising. Uh, so it's, it's an unstable econ economy. It's unfair. Uh, it also, you know, increasing levels of debt. There's loads of evidence that, that shows that there's one of the worst in, um, factors for your sort of personal well-being is the level of indebtedness uh, <coughs> that, that you're in. This point about unstable, so I mean that leads in, I've just given sort of one example of a cause of instability, the um, inequality in wages, but there are several uh, systemic risks that uh, we see. So increasingly, those of you that are understand systems thinking will know that you know, increasingly economic systems are built for efficiency uh, rather than resilience. So supply chains are very taut around the world. A small disruption in one factory somewhere might disrupt you know, production in many factories all around the world. Um, you, you know, that, and this could, of course, be incredibly inhumane. Um, if you think about um, supposed efficiency in agriculture and what that means for uh, the, the treatment of livestock, for example, but that is something that's coming home to roost because we have systems that are very um, prone to, you know, sort of negative downturns uh, with, with the slightest economic shock. The systemic financial risk uh, we've. We'll touch on later, but I mean, you know, we've already discovered it. We've lived through it. It happened in 2008. And this is really an unstable financial system that is vulnerable to huge flows of capital moving rapidly across borders around, around the world. That hasn't, that hasn't been constrained in any way. And neither has the current money system that relies on banks to create money when they lend, the credit-based, debt-based money system. Very, very unstable, although understanding of that is improving. And then we've, we still, you know, the euro crisis hasn't gone away. We haven't heard much about it in the headlines, but, you know, I'm regularly sort of um, 
hearing people talking about European banks still being very vulnerable to, to, uh, you know, to a potential collapse because the, the euro crisis still isn't solved. Um, and those chronic imbalances, uh, not least between China and, and the US, for example, I mean, we, we're now, we've now got the fiscal cliff that we get used to uh, living with, you know, in the US, where we all sit there wondering or not it's going to default on its debt and bring the uh, financial system down with it. So we've got a global economy that is incredibly unstable. And then the final one was unhappy. Uh, I'm only going to give you one chance on this, but Neff does a lot of work on the concept of well-being and has you know, been a long advocate of GDP not being a very good measure of progress. It measures production, but it doesn't measure progress. Point made very well by Schumacher. And in the UK, for example, we can say there isn't really any correlation between constantly increasing consumption. It doesn't, doesn't make you more satisfied. It doesn't improve your life satisfaction. Um, it should be said, that's beyond a certain level. When you look at these graphs, there is a certain level of consumption of material, uh, you know, basic needs that have to be met. And a lot of the world uh, still hasn't met that. <laughs> so they need growth in consumption and production. But we sure as hell don't in the UK um, you know, if, if life satisfaction is what we're about. So, can the current economic system um, solve the, these four problems? Let's have a think about that. Uh, well, no, it can't, and there's five reasons why. Okay, there's five reasons, five fundamental flaws with economics uh, as we currently have it. Um, market prices are always wrong. I'll explain that in a minute. We confuse ends with... Well, I'll go through each of these. We confuse ends with means. It's a very odd view of human behaviour that economists have. Um, we, economists don't like to talk about laws of thermodynamics. They, they, they get in, you, know, you don't want to contemplate those because they upset a few things. So, uh, in fact, most of them don't even understand the laws of thermodynamics, which means that they carry on happily uh, you know, ignoring them. And it, it misunderstands money. So what do I mean by market prices are always wrong? Well, let's talk about apples. Let's talk about apples. So anybody who's done some economics may have come across this concept of externalities. What does that mean? It means that there are lots of impacts uh, from production and consumption that are external to the market. They are not reflected in the price. They may be social impacts. They may be pollution being the classic case, costs that are imposed on other people from that market activity that are not reflected in the prices. That means that the outcome of that market is not a good one for society. It means it is suboptimal to use some economics uh, jargon. It means that we have got the economy can settle in a, uh, a pattern which is consistently harming um, society and the environment because the prices are wrong. Now, in mainstream economists will recognize this. What they don't necessarily uh, except is how widespread, endemic, and serious this is. So the difference between them and me and my colleagues at NEF is that we think that my, this, my problem with externalities is massive. And I'm just going to try and illustrate what, what that means, really. So uh, any of you with kids, I'm sure, will be very familiar with this little thing here. It's a fruit shoot. Uh, it's a juice drink. It doesn't actually have very much juice in it, unfortunately. Uh, but, but if you've got any small children, uh, if they're anything like mine, uh, they will constantly badger you to buy these and feed them to them. So, uh, because of course, if you offered them an apple and a glass of water, that definitely wouldn't, that would, you know, that's not going to wash, is it? Uh, which is a shame because these grow on trees and this falls out of the sky a lot in Devon. <laughs> and, uh, but this doesn't. So, what's involved in this, you know, and what's not reflecting the price of this? Well, where do we start? Um, you know, it has got aspartame in it, which, which many people think is a carcinogenic uh, chemical. Um, it is, as you see, it is in a plastic bottle, uh, which is made from petrochemicals, which is a, uh, a non-renewable finite resource that we're consuming to sort of make this uh, very attractive plastic thing. Uh, it is made in one factory in Britain, which runs 24 hours a day on a massive production line, consuming vast quantities of energy. It is then loaded onto massive articulated lorries, which are shipped all around the roads, all around Europe, with, filled with these little things to put into the shops. Uh, when they're in the shops, uh, you will find that your um, darling young children have been marketed to, probably well, in the UK, um, fairly mercilessly with TV advertising, with social media, um, with all sorts of things which are sort of inducing uh, young children who really shouldn't be subjected to this sort of thing, in my view, uh, to, to pester their parents to buy it. 
another externality. And then, of course, when you're done with it, you'll, um, you know, uh, of course, around here, I'm sure you'll recycle it carefully. But not everybody does that. And so these will end up in an enormous swirl, possibly somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, which I'm sure some of you have heard about. Uh, and while it's there, I mean, that's not just unsightly, obviously. There it would take uh, something like 10,000 years to uh, de decompose. Before it does that, it's quite likely to be, um, you know, uh, to, to harm wildlife. You know, birds will attempt to eat it. It will get caught up in various things. Um, they don't put that on the label, do they? They don't put any of that on the label. I mean, how can, in the price of this, how can the price of this reflect that journey? You know, that consumption of non-renewable resources, uh, the huge, um, you know, pollution, <coughs> carbon emitted by transporting these things around the shops, um, the sort of the effect that advertising has of constant dissatisfaction, because remember, what advertising does is it creates unmet desires. That's the point of it. That's how it works. So, of course, you know, um, I then uh, refuse to buy my 10-year-old son fruit shoots, and he feels sad and thinks I'm a bad dad. Uh, I'll explain to him, hopefully, well, maybe he can watch this lecture later when he gets older, and he'll, you, like, you know, be able to understand then why I'm not letting him have these things. Uh, so, you know, market price, I mean, it's, it's kind of, when you look at it like that, I mean, how, it's all easy to say, but, but this is a free, you know, consumers choose to buy it, producers sort of choose to produce it, you should just let them get on with it, shouldn't you? Well... I'm not sure you should just let them get on with it because market prices are always wrong. So here's the next problem. We confuse ends with means. I'm sure some of you have come across this wonderful speech by Robert Kennedy. Who has actually? Hands up. Who knows about the speech? Oh, uh, yeah, a few of you. A few of you. Okay, well, this is... I, I shall read it. I shall read it out. Um, there was a great speech in 1968 made by um, Robert Kennedy where he said this, I'll, I'll read it out because it's very poetic. Gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and the destruction of the redwood and the loss of our natural wonder in chaotic sprawl. It does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education or the joy of their play, the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages. It measures everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. But economics doesn't have anything to say really about anything. That, because economics is, is the... Well, I mean, you could, it's perhaps unfair to blame economics, actually. This is much a political problem. You know, the politics say that the only thing that matters is increasing GDP. You know, all we ever hear about is, has the economy grown? Where's the growth? You, you see if a politician can finish a sentence without using the word growth. I quite often go into the Department for Business uh, in, in London, and... They rebranded themselves in the midst of the recession as the Department for Growth. So when you go in there, there's posters everywhere where you kind of, you know, the Department for Growth, we have policies for growth, you sit on the sofa for growth, and you go into the meeting room for growth, and you talk to the Minister for Growth, and it's like, oh my God, you know, this is obsessing about growth, you know? But it's just a means to an end, you know? It's a means to an end. Growth, the point of, of production, you would think, is to produce high well-being. It's a means to an end, not to the end in itself, but we've lost sight of that. So when David Cameron, for example, uh, exhorts you know, us all in the UK to, uh, you know, to be winners in the global race, we've got to compete with China, everybody's terrified about the Chinese because they're really good at maths and they're going to come and sort of you know, beat us at everything. And you know, he says we've got to you know, compete in the global race. Well, why? Well, what's a, you know, what do we get? If we, what's at the finishing line? You know, what's the prize? For this, or is it just oh no? Because it's actually a constant, never-ending, continual race. And I'm always sort of reminded of the um, the part in uh, Animal Farm, George Orwell's Animal Farm, where the, the pigs kind of get all the other farm animals to keep working harder and harder and harder, and eventually the shire horse dies, and it's all sort of very miserable. So um, that's that's what that's what we're in for. That's what our political system is dishing up for us: constant obsession with growth. Which actually, as pointed out here, a lot of things are counted as production, which are actually clearly harmful. You know, crime is good for growth. I, I, that you need to say no more than that, really. So that's a problem. Now, here's a third problem, OK? There's a really odd view of human behaviour in neoclassical economics. Uh, so, we, you know, th this view of humans as selfish, <laughs> rational utility maximisers. Do we have any rational utility maximisers in the room tonight? <laughs> no? Yeah, well, one, yeah, so possibly, yeah. Uh, well, I have been known to do the odd spreadsheet comparing prices and qualities of a consumer durable, you know? Just this is sort of, you know, according to economists, this is, that's the sort of thing that you do every day when you walk out of the house. 
Uh, and, and actually, there was a great, in, in a book by Steve Keen called Debunking Economics, he has this passage where you know, they worked out that if, if people really did make these decisions, constantly sort of making these rational decisions, comparing price and quality, what am I going to buy? If you went into a supermarket, right, you'd have to take a supercomputer with you. Because you can't, that's not how people work. They just buy the same. If they bought something last week and it was okay, they just buy that again, pick that off the shelf, and you can fill your trolley and off you go. You know? um, there are all sorts of ways we can understand human behaviour that's a lot more sophisticated than this. But unfortunately, this has a very interesting uh, effect, this, this view, this view of human behaviour. And, and here they are. And this is, this is, there have been lots of psychological research um, into what happens to economic students. <laughs> altruistic values drop among economic majors. I'm sure that people on the MA in transition economics are excluded from this. <laughs> economic students stay selfish even though their peers become more cooperative. So they, you, there are lots of scenarios where you play these prisoner's dilemma type games where if you all cooperate, then the outcome is great for everybody. But if one of you sort of reneges on the other, then the outcome is terrible for everybody. So the economists always cheat. You know, they always, they always sort of, you know, because that's what they think, that's what they've been taught actually human behaviour is like. Well, it's unproven whether it's self-selected that economists, you know, w want to study economics because they, they have this view of human behaviour or, or studying economics. Um, I think that's unproven. Um, so, so after taking economics, students actually think that everybody else is also selfish and that's what they'll expect of other people. But worst of all, and I should have given you this health warning before I started this presentation, just thinking about economics <laughs> can make us less caring. Yes, yes, indeed. A lot of the research often, it's not just economics majors, they do MBA students as well, and it's much the same thing. It's this whole, you know, management, management theory has, shares a lot of the sort of same problems. It kind of assumes this rationalist, positivist view of the world that, you know, we're kind of uh, almost like sort of machines, homo economicus. So, uh, so you, know, if, if you, if you, you know, if you present the assumptions about human behaviour that economics rests on, and you, and you ask a psychologist or a sociologist or a you know, a, a philosopher or, a, or a, a faith leader, you know, and they'll say, well, that, that's, not, that's not a view of human nature. How can you build your models based on that? It's absurd. <coughs> the inconvenient laws of thermodynamics. Uh, well, this is... What, what this is trying to... This is a traditional... You'll find this in economics textbooks, and, and basically all it says, it says, well, the economy is a bit like this. You've got households and businesses, firms, and... You know, um, you get this flow of products coming from the businesses to the households who buy them and then they provide their labour to the businesses and it all goes around in a circle and that's all sort of measured and, you know. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, we have these factors of production, uh, capital, labour and land. Um, well, that, that's all very good, isn't it? Now, the only problem is it, of course, assumes no shortage in inputs and it doesn't really say much about what happens to the outputs. They kind of disappear out of the model somewhere else, you know, maybe a different planet, but unfortunately, no, it's this one, mm -hmm. and it just, th these things just sort of come into the model from somewhere, you know, it doesn't have a very good account of the planet, which is why you can get away with not understanding the laws of thermodynamics, but, you know, in, in reality, of course, oops, yes, it, uh, thermodynamics uh, catches up with you, and there was a Nobel, Nobel scientist, Ra uh, Raymond Soddy, who actually explained this really well, um, and he explained it by reference to, to pig farmers. He imagined two different pig farmers. One is a, a farmer who has some real pigs, like our farmer here. And, and the others are virtual pig farmers. <laughs> so we've got a pair of virtual pig farmers here. <laughs> and what he said was, you know, the real pig farmers have real pigs. Now they need to feed them and they need to clear the waste and they need to sort of look after them. And actually there's only so many piglets that a pig can have. So there's a natural limit, uh, you know, and, you, you know, you, you're obeying, you, this, this guy's obeying the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, these guys, well, you know, this wonderful thing called compound interest. You know, money doesn't decay. It's not subject to the laws of thermodynamics. It doesn't rust. It is permanent, and you can create it now. It doesn't even need to sort of be a physical thing because money is created as a digital, it's just a number, isn't it? Uh, so you put compound interest on that, and you're away. So the virtual pig farmers... Uh, they set off with their virtual pigs and start breeding them. And, you know, before long, they've got masses of herd of pigs. Fantastic. They've done so much better than the real pig farmer. Of course, the problem is that sooner or later, they want to cash in their virtual pigs because uh, they can't eat those. 
And at that point, you discovered that the number of virtual pigs has got hugely out of kilter to the, uh, the number of real pigs. And at that point, the value of virtual pigs collapses. And that is an explanation using pigs of the financial crisis of 2008, <laughs> uh, where basically we discovered that a lot of products in the financial system were virtual pigs, and they weren't worth anything. Um, and you know, it, that's, that's a financial system that is disconnected from the laws of thermodynamics. It, it's, or as, as Soddy put it, you, know, you cannot permanently pit an absurd human convention such as the spontaneous increment of debt by compound interest against the natural law of the spontaneous decrement of wealth, entropy, second law of thermodynamics. That's what Raymond Soddy said. So, you know, if I was speaking to a, a classroom of uh, first-year undergraduates at um, the LSE, had been doing the th they would be utterly baffled. They wouldn't, they wouldn't really understand what the hell I'm talking about here. They wouldn't know, you know, um, what, what the laws of thermodynamics were. But I would suggest to you that it's quite important to understand that if you're going to have any economics that means anything in the real world. And here's the final one, quite close to my heart, obviously. Uh, misunderstanding money. So uh, this kind of gets back to answering the Queen's question right at the beginning. Why didn't anybody see it coming? One of the main reasons is mainstream economics doesn't have a proper understanding of money. It doesn't understand that it's created by the banking system. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with that phenomenon, um, our book, Where Does Money Come From?, is available now on uh, Kobo and, uh, and by post. Um, but the banking system does create money, and it can create unlimited quantities of it pretty well. Money isn't metal. It is trust inscribed, says Neil Ferguson, who's, who's, a, who's a historian. And actually, the, what, I mean, this is a Bernard Leotard uh, quote, actually, but also the way that we describe it in NEF. Money is actually a social relationship. Now, that's a very positive thing, because that gives us some solutions that we'll talk about later on. But this is, uh, I mean, I have, I'm skating over this bit, because it's all quite complex stuff, but there is a problem in neoclassical economics that it doesn't understand where money comes from, which is quite shocking, really, but it doesn't. I mean, or indeed, as, I mean, the, the model used at the Bank of England to try and predict what's going to happen in the economy and what they should do with interest rates doesn't contain banks in it, and it doesn't contain money. Because you know, money is a sort of neutral thing, you don't need to put it in, according to neoclassical models of the economy, which just shows um, how unhelpful they are. Uh, so um, now a lot of people sort of, uh, those that were on the, the course, who've been doing the course, and I th I, you know, have learned this, this week that there are other ways you can create money, there are other systems. You can have governments that print money and put it in circulation. We've actually sort of started doing this with QE, although it's a little bit different. And a lot of people, us included, are saying, well, the Bank of England has created £375 billion. Pounds. It's a lot more than that in the US and in Japan. And even the ECB is getting on the act. Could not some of that created money being used for something useful? Let's say let's build some low-carbon uh, energy infrastructure or let's, uh, uh, you know, let's insulate everybody's houses or let's, just, let's put people to work. Let's do something useful with that. And you'll get this reaction, well, you can't allow governments to get their hands on, on money creation. You can't let democratically elected governments create money because they'll create too much of it. They'll spend it unproductively. It'll lead to hyperinflation and the collapse of the banking system. And we'll all end up with this. This is a Zimbabwean uh, note. It's $100 trillion. It's one of the very famous examples of hyperinflation in the modern era. The other one, of course, uh, earlier on was the Weimar Republic of Germany. So, no, we certainly don't want uh, a currency collapse and hyperinflation. But it's kind of very, very oversimplistic. There have been lots of historical examples of government-created money that haven't led to this outcome. And indeed, when you look at the history of both the economy of Zimbabwe and of the Weimar Republic, there are many other reasons why those economists, these economies collapsed. And the government money printing comes late in the cycle as a desperate attempt to stave off the inevitable. It's not the cause of the collapse at all. But here's the thing. So if we think that actually it's much safer to leave money creation in the hand of banks, what happens? Well, in the lead-up to the financial crisis, they created far too much money because they lent too much. There was a credit bubble. They lent it really unproductively because actually I've got a graph I was showing earlier on to the students in the course that shows that in the UK, virtually all of the increase in credit over the last decade went into the financial system and property speculation, mortgages, personal consumption, not, not into productive investment, building new schools, hospitals, whatever. Uh, it led to massive asset hyperinflation. So, you know, you're getting all these financial instruments and other assets, asset bubbles happening everywhere, stock market, and the collapse of the banking system. <laughs> so you, what you ended up with, <coughs> Lehman Brothers. So, uh, you know, 
maybe, maybe we should be a little bit more open-minded about, about monetary reform and changing the monetary system. I'll talk about that in a minute. So in short, you know, is it time for new economics? And uh, I mean, this is a bit unfair, but I'm going to say it anyway. Would you go to an 18th century surgeon? If you, you, know, you needed an amputation, this guy's having his leg off. Doesn't seem particularly happy about it. Uh, lots of very well-dressed gentlemen holding him down. Maybe it's an amateur surgeon, I don't know. I think everybody had a go at it in those days. Oh, it's just a sore, isn't it? Would you want to go to an 18th century surgeon? No, you wouldn't, because you know, there have been many, many advances in medicine since the 18th century. So would you go to an 18th century economist? <laughs> this is Adam Smith's inquiry into the cause of the wealth of nations. No, you wouldn't. And yet, many of the fundamental principles of economics um, start from, from this book, actually, and, and haven't been, I would suggest, haven't been properly updated <laughs> to reflect the advances in understanding that have taken place since the 18th century. I mean, that's a bit unfair, I mean, it's a bit, because in fact, you know, when we talk about new economics, uh, the reality is that, uh, I was talking with Tim over dinner about this, that um, a lot of the ideas that we draw on, uh, Neff and other people draw on traditions um, you know, from ecological uh, economics onwards, uh, draw on, on, for example, these three gentlemen. Now, I think you probably know who this is. Thank you very much. Got to have a, you know, always have a photo of Schumacher in your presentation at Schumacher <laughs> College. Um, what about what about this gentleman? Uh, Ruskin. Yes, Ruskin in 1870, I think it was, wrote a book called Unto This Last, and it was uh, he wrote a withering critique of economics. Um, he came up with the quote that there is no wealth but life. He was a sort of early critic of the idea that GDP was important and that, that you know, economics was missing all that was really good about life. Um, and he came up with this sort of hilarious uh, critique. I mean, actually, even in those days, there were all these models, these abstract models, and it was getting very mathematical, and economists wanted to sort of seem like scientists. So they had all these models, and they made a certain assumptions, and then they had the models, and that proved certain things. And he said... You know, he, he said, well, I don't, I don't really... Um, it's not that I think the models are wrong. It's just that I challenge the assumptions. So, for example, he said, well, you could, you could assume that uh, the human body had no skeleton. And that means that you could sort of roll people up into sort of pellets or flatten them into cakes, and you could stretch them out in all sorts of ways. And that would be true, given your assumption that there was no skeleton. Um, so the, the theory would be perfect in every sense, apart from in its applicability. Right. And, uh, you know, he was never invited to write another article on economics after that, actually, funny enough. So, so he, was, he, he spotted the problems earlier on. Um, and anyone know who that might be? John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill. Very good. Um, so he's one of the early classical economists. But what's interesting about Mill, um, who, whose views we might all necessarily agree, agree, of, uh, agree with on sort of utilitarianism and things like that, but very interestingly, he foresaw um, a steady-state economy. He thought that economic growth was just sort of a temporary thing. You'd get to kind of the optimum size, like people do in nature, animals, we all grow to kind of the size that we need to be, and then we stop growing. Uh, and he thought the economy would be the same. And he thought back, right back sort of at the beginning, if you like, of, uh, of classical economics, that, you know, it'd be absurd to think the economy could grow forever. Uh, it's, a, it's a shame that nobody seems to remember that in the treasury anymore, but there we go. So... Right, this is where, we, uh, this is where we, we, we think about some positive solutions. Uh, how can we do it differently? How can we overcome all these problems? You know, are there new sort of economic thinking, new economic tools? Uh, well, I'm just going to run through a few. This isn't a complete, doesn't add up to a complete sort of manifesto or package or kind of like, you know, um, if you could go away, if you all go up sort of home tomorrow, you, you sort of do all these things, it's not necessarily going to get us there, and they're not that easy. But anyway, some of you will be familiar with these. Um, now, we mentioned that we, we confuse ends with means. We've got the wrong measure, the wrong things. GDP isn't the sort of economic growth, isn't the be-all and end-all. So at NEF, we do, and I recommend you have a play on this website, happyplanetindex.org. We try and introduce different measures of how an economy is performing. Anybody sort of seen this before, the Happy Planet Index? OK, oh, a couple of people. Well, um, what it does is you, you say, well, what is it that we're after? We're after long and happy lives. And bearing in mind that there's, you have to use the data that's out there, so it's, it's quite simplistic. But you take the average life expectancy in a, in a country and you multiply it by the reported life satisfaction. 
because the, the UN does these surveys in every, every country. So we've got these statistics, long and happy lives. That's one number. You then say, well, okay, that's, what, that's our output from the economy. What's the input? The input is natural resources. It's the ecological footprint. So you measure, you take the economy's ecological footprint, and then you can see how much of the planet's resources that economy is having to consume to produce a certain level of human well-being. And Schumacher talked about this. He said our economies are incredibly inefficient. He said a Buddhist economist would find it excessively odd, the idea that you have to consume huge amounts in order to be happy. An efficient state of affairs would be to consume the minimum possible in order to be happy. Uh, and so this is kind of getting at that. So what's interesting here is this does not tell you the best place in the world to live or the happiest place. But you will notice that the US is, is, is flashing red, uh, has a very inefficient economy. OK, it does have high life expectancy and actually reasonably high life satisfaction, but boy, does it consume the planet at a rate of knots in order to achieve that. So that, is, that gets a red under our system. Now, the other red, you'll notice, sub-Saharan Africa. What's the story there? Consuming way below its fair share of the planet. But that's because those economies, or indeed those political systems in some cases, or because of war or various other reasons, including the weather sometimes, is um, it's not producing long and happy lives. So that's a, that's a place actually where you'd want to be consuming more of the planet's resources and producing more. So what does, well, Europe's kind of in the middle. It's not, not as bad you know, as, as the US, but it's still you know, amber. It's not good. You know, South America. Then we, the green ones. Interestingly, you've got sort of Central America, various economies where they have very good life satisfaction, uh, but they have relative, and that's largely because the social cohesion is very high, uh, you know, social bonds are still very sort of intact, um, but they just don't consume a very high amount per head. And, you know, the, these, these countries th would never come top of any normal economist <coughs> league table uh, because the US comes at the top and, other, and, you know, all the rich companies come at the top. So this is a, just a different way of challenge. If that's how we measured progress, then the priorities would then look very different, wouldn't they? Uh, because if, you're, if your aim was to try and get up the top of the league table, the priority in the US would be to cut your consumption of natural resources, and the priority in Africa would be to increase the levels of human well-being. What are the grey areas, lack of information? Uh, I think, yes, I think that's where the statistics weren't collected by the, uh, by the UN. Are there um, any green areas? Sorry? Are there any green areas? Yeah, well, it doesn't come out brilliantly from the... Um, yeah, there are. I mean, there's, a, there's an infographic. If you go onto the site, actually, there's quite a good infographic that shows, I think it's Venezuela versus the US on all the statistics. Um, but it tends to be small island economies. Um, I mean, in the UK, they published some statistics recently, and it was, quite, it was pretty good down here for well-being and up in the islands of Scotland, and it was grim in the three worst boroughs were uh, Islington, Lambeth, and um, Hackney in London, largely due to extreme inequality. So here's another point. Now, I was framing this as a citizens versus markets. Now, um, one of the issues with the market economy that we have that is reliant on consumption, very led around advertising, is that it treats us all merely as consumers. And we're not, of course, we are citizens as well. We do consume, but we're citizens. But it, it, it kind of it exercises the consumer muscle, and it doesn't exercise the citizen muscle. This is a way of um, organizing production that treats us as citizens involved in the production of our own services. And it was Ellen Ostrom, one of the early... Edgar Kahn, the uh, pioneer of time banks, was very much about this. Um, and, you know, I, I, an example... For those who haven't come across this concept before of co-production, let me give you a sort of little example of it. And um, that particularly in health, they've shown that you can improve clinical outcomes. For example, on if people come in for an operation... They did an experiment where they had a volunteer, somebody who'd recently had that operation, and they volunteered to act as a sort of buddy, a meter and greeter for the person coming in. And it's just simple stuff like showing them, oh, you know, you, that nurse is really nice, don't ask that one. Uh, this is where you make the tea. Uh, make sure that you remember to do this and the other before you go in. Don't worry, it's all fine. I've just done it and I'm fine. And that kind of reassurance actually hugely improved the recovery. And then they go and visit them when they're discharged, which, of course, the doctors don't have time to do, uh, all the nurses but these volunteers visited them when they were discharged and went home. There's a huge cut in readmission rates after operations to hospitals because of that. So this is terrific. So you're getting much better outcomes, clinical outcomes. The volunteers who did this, of course, felt wonderful about it. This is an incredibly fulfilling thing for them to be doing. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it didn't actually cost anything. It was involving citizens in the co-production of their own services. Very powerful idea. 
Here's another thing we have to do. Well, you mentioned my colleague Anna Coot is unfortunately not going to be able to give her talk next week, but she would have been talking about this. So here's a little sneak preview. Rebalancing time. Uh, John Maynard Keynes in 1930 in an essay called The Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, which, uh, you know, after the crash in the midst of the, 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 the Depression, he wrote this to try and cheer everybody up. He's sort of saying, it's all going to be fine when the, for our grandchildren. One of the things he predicted was that the economy would be so productive we would all be having to work a 15-hour week. And the real problem would be to work out what to do with all our free time. Is anybody having that problem? No, <laughs> no that's odd, isn't it? What, what went wrong there? What went wrong there? Well, actually, when you look at graphs, it sort of work, average working time steadily declined until the 1970s. And then it stuck and in some places started to rise again. Uh, funnily enough, coinciding with the onset of neoliberal political structures. So what we'd really need to do is, and indeed for a steady state economy, you need to take increased productivity in the form of increased leisure time rather than increased wages and consumption. Uh, and you know, we've calculated, we have a report called 21 Hours because it's a very back of the envelope cal calculation in some senses, but it just says that actually in the UK right now, the economy is sufficiently productive that we could all just work a three day week, everyone would have a job, and that would produce everything that we needed. So, uh, not quite 15, but, but actually he, he was remarkably prescient in, in his sort of basic calculation. The problem is the economy is not structured in a way that allows us to do this. When, incidentally, because of course you can't afford to all work three, three days a week, so you've got to pay the mortgage, you've got to pay all the debt off, haven't you, that you've sort of incurred earlier on. Um, but when people have had this choice, so um, for example, one of the big accountancy firms, uh, rather than make redundancies after the financial crash, it, it offered its staff the option of everybody going on a four-day week and not really expecting people to take it up. It was wildly popular. Uh, all those accountants were like, yeah, I'll work a four-day week. I'm not as wedded to my career as you think I am. I'd rather have some more leisure time. But normally people don't get that choice. Monetary reform. Any, any people who are sort of enthusiastic monetary reformers in the room? Oh, it must be somebody. Oh, Tim, go on then. Uh, so, so this is, I mean, uh, this again, it's kind of just skating over it a little bit, but I would encourage you to try and read more about it. This is quite a big area, but given that I was suggesting there are fundamental problems with the money system itself and the financial system, and that banks at the moment create money, but uh, they kind of misuse that power, really. They create it for the wrong things. They create too much of it and allocate it to very uh, sound investments. Um, and indeed, this, this, this creates a huge amount of debt in the economy that needn't be there. There are alternative monetary systems, and and, and these are the main two that probably should happen. One is sovereign money or public money. This is money issued by the government to fund expenditure and collected via taxation later on. Sounds a bit outlandish to people who have never come across this concept. But believe it or not, this was in the 1930s in the US. There was something called the Chicago Plan that was supported by a majority of US economics professors in the 1930s post their last financial crisis. That actually, this is exactly what we should do. It means abolishing fractional reserve banking. You take away the power to create money from banks, and it is issued by the government. Uh, it, would, it would wipe out in the US. The IMF brought out a paper in December 2012 where they ran a model and said, well, if we implemented this reform, what would happen? And it said that the economy would be more productive. It would get rid of all banking instability and banking runs. And you'd be able to wipe out $10 trillion of US government debt. I think that's probably worth investigating a bit further, wouldn't you? Uh, and then, of course, this is of those with Totnes. We've got the Totnes pound. Complementary currencies. Is, this relies on an awful lot of work politically before that reform ever happens. Not that we're not trying. But nevertheless, you've got to recognise that's something you've got to win political power to implement. These, complementary currencies, much more empowering. You can get on with this in your community. You can create your own currencies. You can create your own means of exchange. The Totnes pound, the Bristol pound, the Brixton pound, time banks other ways of allowing people to match unmet needs with spare resources. Um, and, you know, there's an explosion of different sorts of community currencies arising all around the world. I mean, a lot of interest in places that are suffering economic stress, such as Greece and in Spain and Portugal. Um, but also, they can often be sort of useful in areas which, you know, apparently wealthy, but there are still people who are marginalised and there's still things that need to be done and you can create these new sorts of currencies. So monetary reform is another key new economics concept and, and, and tool that we can use. So there is hope. 
And if any of that sounds like it might be a bit of a tall order to implement, I always like to end a talk with this quote, if I can, by Oscar Wilde, and that says, a map of the world that does not include utopia is not even worth glancing at. So uh, let's have our map and let's, let's paint the utopia on it and let's, uh, let's head there. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs>